Welcome, Francis Weller. It's a real joy to, well, to have you in the Seekers Forum, and I look forward to talking to you. A pleasure to be with you, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks. So I wanted to start with something you have written that I found very intriguing, uh, and it feels like a good opening to our discussion today about the holy question and how we can live with what we know. And that is, why do you say that the heroic quest has come to an end? Well, that idea and the ideology behind that idea has always been about knowing, coming to an answer, being able to succeed, you know, being able to manage through crises. And I think we've come to a point where we don't know. We've come to a place where uncertainty has become more true than clarity. And we are now at a point where we have to, in a sense, become more attuned to listening than to controlling. The heroic enterprise is about success, it's about climbing, it's about confidence, it's about assurance, and we are in a descent right now. We are going down into the unknown, into grief, into losses that we can't even barely imagine the amount of losses that we're, we're being asked to metabolize around species and you know familiarities and the, the assurances of life. We don't even know if our species is going to be here at a certain point down the road. So we're being asked to go down into darkness, and we have to trust soul knows more about this darkness than we do. So rather than the ascent of control and dominance and success, we're being asked to take a different journey into the dark. There's an idea in the Inuit tradition called Kartsaluni. And Kartsaluni translates sitting quietly together in the dark, waiting patiently for something creative to occur. I like this idea. We don't know, and all of our efforts to try to uh, push agendas just kind of reinforce the old problems, don't they? Mm -hmm. And technology is not going to solve it. Maybe some it can mitigate some things, I'm hoping. But we need an entirely different imaginal approach to this. And that happens in the dark, mm -hmm. in the dream world. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I mean by the end of the heroic uh, enterprise. It seems to me that it's requiring a different kind of heroism. It's the heroism of not knowing. It's the heroism of waiting and patience and receptivity. Right. And, right. and the, hero, the hero has always had to go through the dark to reach uh, illumination. Yes, yes. So is it that we're in a different phase of the heroic journey? Um, I mean, it could be. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit leery of, of keeping, keeping that word so prominent because that keeps it at the forefront of our uh, our thought process that's appropriate for a 20 year old that's an appropriate thing to really step out and take charge and you know initiate the whole word of initiation comes in there to initiate a life but in the old language the, the hero was always in service to something larger than himself or themselves now the hero has been sadly kind of refined more to self-interest. How do I survive? So part of what I'd like about letting go of the heroic is it makes room for other imaginal possibilities to come in, like village mind. Village mind is very different than the heroic mind. How do we approach this? How do we come into this dark time together? How do we support one another? You know, how do we encourage one another to let go, to dream, to uh, let the creative impulse arise out of the darkness of soul? That's a very different mind. Uh, it's more of an indigenous mind, uh, where it's a again village-mindedness. There's a wonderful elder from the Okanagan community called Jeanette Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And she said, in our, village, in, our, in our community, we, 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 our lives are shaped like this. Community first, family second, and the individual is last. She said, you have inverted that 100% in white Western capitalistic culture. The individual is first, 
family second, and community, they use the word all the time, but it has no blood in it. Mm-hmm. It's an abstract rhetoric. Mm-hmm. So what I'm hoping is that we can begin to remember some of what our deep time ancestors knew, which, which was we survived communally. Mm-hmm. We did not survive individualistically. Mm-hmm. We survived together. And that's what we have to remember again. So when you talk about being initiated into a new, that we're being initiated into a new kind of awareness and you, 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 you uh, compare entitlement to entanglement, you're saying we need to move from the entitled perspective to one of, of interdependence and the awareness of our connection. Right. I mean, initiation in its old imagination was really about break, breaking apart the old identity, right? and to break into the largest possible imagination of who we are, that I am part body, but I'm also part family, I'm part community. I'm part of the clan life of what am I spiritually responsible for? I'm also part of the cosmos. Then I'm part of the landscape, I'm part of the watershed, I'm part spruce, I'm part eagle, I'm part earthworm, I'm part all of these beings. And when I'm in my largest identity, my fidelity falls out into that field, not just my individual survival, but the survival of the whole field. I mean, isn't that the truth? I mean, ultimately, our survival depends upon the survival of the whole field. How yeah. much of our anxiety levels and, and the fear that we carry as a culture is connected to the fact that we are so individually oriented as opposed to communally? How, what's the relation between anxiety and self-absorption? I think they're so completely entangled. I mean, if you go back to that model, and I I can't tell if this is on on the screen or not, but uh, the idea that the community first, family second, individual last, in that model, no matter what happens to me, I'm covered. The village is here to, to catch me if I'm ill, if I've been injured. You know, if something happens to me, I'm caught. In this system of individualism, whatever befalls me, it's up to me to somehow catch myself. And the ambient field right now is riddled with anxiety, fear, uncertainty, grief. This is what we're breathing in every day. And it is built upon that foundation of individualism, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So you can't have a lot of uh, restful thought and and deep, easy breathing when the ground beneath you is so narrow, so thin, that the next moment you could be the one on your own, basically, unable to take care of yourself and survive. That's built into traditional culture, and it's relatively absent in industrial technological society i like the story you tell about waking up i think it was after election day or before election day and being filled with anxiety and then realizing the entanglement and how that really yeah can you, yeah. can you say something about that yeah i was i was this was in 2020 and i was you know forgive my political leanings but i was very worried that this upcoming election in 2020 was going to be the same. And I was going to bed that night filled with dread, uh, kind of hopelessly anticipating more of the same. Uh, And I was about to get in bed and something turned me around. I call that soul. And took me to my bookshelf where I pulled a little collection of essays by a Chickasaw elder, Linda Hogan, called, and the book is called Dwellings. And I opened it up to the chapter, All My Relations. And I realized I had forgotten all my relationships. To feel dread is to feel disconnected from the wider network of intimacies that are available to us constantly. And so I began to remember stars and moon and these dug firs out my window and the redwoods over here and the sorrel and the fern and the the uh, blue jay that just flew up under the tree. I began to remember all of those and the dread dissipated instantly. So when we remember our entanglement, when we remember our larger communion, 
that eases that sense of loneliness and dread and fear and uncertainty. Not to say that it wipes it out, but it gives it a place to be held, a larger holding space. Yeah. When you, can you, for people who aren't familiar with the distinction between soul and spirit as orientations, uh, could you just say briefly what you mean when you talk about soul versus a spiritual orientation? Yeah, it's a big topic. Um, I spent 10 weeks doing a series on that very question. Uh, generically, you know, simply, soul is really the energy of descent, as I was saying before. It would, it's what takes us down into our most intimate places of vulnerability, tenderness, grief, uh, loss, failure. Um, you know, when we think about our most intimate moments, they're not about strength, they're about vulnerability, mm. about sharing something tender with a friend, with a partner. Um, those we call them soulful conversations. Right? They're soulful moments. Spirit rises. Spirit has this quality of ascension. It likes far seeing, it loves clarity and vision. We need both. So I often just, we think about Handel's Messiah and the Alleluia chorus, it's just celestial, right? It's just, we feel sublimely lifted when we hear that chorus. And then we have Leonard Cohen singing about a broken Alleluia. Mm -hmm. The same language, but a very different quality of feeling drop down into the body, take into our knees, you know, in a very different quality. So we can imagine it as, as a continuum and they need each other too. Spirit without any soul becomes too detached, almost cool in relation to other people's suffering. Too much soul, not enough spirit, we get bogged down and mired in the heaviness and density of life. So we need both, we need them. In a, in a beautiful conversation. William Blake, some of his paintings have these relationships between soul and spirit, you know, and coming into this embrace with one another. That would be the ideal. And so as seekers, as people on the path of self-knowledge, is it up to us to diagnose our own soul-spirit ratio and it's self-correct? Self yeah, it's a good thing. I mean, I need more spirit. I need more of that kind of... Uh, far-seeing vision, because I'm a melancholic kind of character, and my life has all been about working with shame and with grief and defeat, and that's a heavy territory. Mm -hmm. And I can get pretty bogged down there, so I need the disciplines of spirit, you know, so I can detach just a little bit and see more clearly uh, what is happening and how to hold it with a little bit more benevolence rather than just the heaviness of it all. So yeah, I, I, I actually, I think that's a very important thing to see. What is my relationship? We tend to favor spirit in this culture. Mm -hmm. You can go across this country and you'll find a meditation center or a yoga center almost in every town. Mm -hmm. it's, you'd be hard pressed to find a place that focuses on soul. Soul is kind of the forgotten. The three of them would be spirit, self, and soul. Our psychology is self-focused. There's almost no soul in our psychology, even though it's the study of soul, psyche, the, the logos of soul, of psyche. It's all about the self. It's about the individuality of my selfhood, which is not a problem, it's not a bad thing, but it, it uh, avoids the depths of the soulful territory. So we are, we're, we're kind of uh, heavy into spirit, heavy into self, and soul is kind of the outcast, you know, sibling in that, in that triumvirate. And so I speak a lot for soul. That's been my, my purpose in life. Well, spirit has this implication of escapism and being able to transcend where soul is purely about self-confrontation. It's about confrontation. It's, a, it's about coming into an intimacy with oneself, mm -hmm. deep friendship. Uh, no matter, see, soul has no conflict with any human experience. Soul is comfortable with defeat, with loss, with shame, with grief. That's just the prime, that's in, in, in alchemy, that's the prima materia. 
That's the stuff soul works with. So oh, that's what we got. We'll work with that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't judge us for this. Our spiritual and our spiritual disciplines at times can look at those things like failure and defeat and grief and say, "Well, we we need to get out of that. Right. We need to rise above that." Soul says, "No, this is this is the this is the food that we're going to be chewing on for a while, and we'll see what comes out of it." You know. And it seems that slowness and slowing down uh, are central to this soulfulness as well. I interviewed James Hillman years ago, and he talked to me about the adventure of slowness as you get older and yeah. how getting out of the bathtub sometimes can be equivalent to climbing a mountain. Uh, so how can that, um, how can uh, reacquainting ourselves with slowness enrich soulfulness for us in this culture? Oh, that's a beautiful question, Mark. Um, there's another more ideas that come out of alchemy and out of the old languages, like noticia, noticing the small details, the little movements of the, of light in the house. You know, we are so addicted to speed. You know, how fast is your cell phone, your computer, your you know, speed has become like like this holy scripture. But to notice the small things, you need to slow back down to the speed of life. My first mentor, I was 27 years old, and this may be where you're getting this question, but I, I was licensed at 27 as a very young, very inexperienced therapist. <laughs> but I was smart enough to know I didn't know anything. So I called the Jung Institute in San Francisco and they gave me you know, quite a few names of analysts in the area. And I called um, this one man named Clark Berry. I said, this, I, this, I like the way this guy sounds. And so I showed up to his office and I opened the door. And man, he was ancient. He was like 60. You know, he was, <laughs> he was so old, you know. And we sat down. The very first thing Clark says to me, he reaches over and he pats this large rock he has by his chair. He said, this is my clock. I operate at geologic speed. And if you're going to work with the soul, you need to learn this rhythm because this is how the soul moves. And he poured into his clock and said, it hates this. So every person I sit with in my practice and every place I go to teach, I tell that story because we are in such a hurry to change. And that hurriedness is often predicated on self-hatred. I don't like these parts of me, so I'm going to get rid of them. But soul says, no, let's slow down and begin to know these outcasts, the ones who carry your grief, your shame, your weakness. And let's get to know them. But that any intimacy requires time, doesn't it? We don't have an instant friendship. We don't have an instant marriage. We have to slowly cultivate the ground of familiarity. And all of that takes time. And in this period of instant communication and clipped messages via text, we don't take the time to write a letter. We don't take the time for a, to sit down with somebody over coffee or tea or a beer and just say, let's tell our stories. You know? So slowing down to me is one of the most essential characteristics of soulful life is coming back into a rhythm that notices body notices light and color, texture, the noticia, the small things of life. That's what makes it meaningful. This isn't how fast we can skate over it. It's how deeply we can go into it. Mm -hmm. right? And that takes time. It takes time. But we fear the depths. We fear the depths because they contain our mortality. They contain grief. You talk about uh, the avoidance of grief being a primary feeder of fear. Yes. Could you say something about that? Well, it kind of goes back to that spirit-soul split in the culture that it's the same split as light and dark. Light, good. Dark, bad. And we can play that out in many ways, racially, uh, psychologically. We have this kind of dualism where soul doesn't split them up. There's the holiness that dwells in the dark. And right now, you and I are having this conversation, but our heartbeats right now, are happening in utter darkness, right? We hope they never see the light of day, right? We want them to continue to hold that 
dark heart thread, uh, that heartbeat that continues to move us. When you abstract it up upward, and the ascension is the only thing that's valued, anytime you begin to go down, you begin to freak out. You begin to get afraid because we are unfamiliar with what is in the darkness and all of our associations are negative. Whereas I have found the darkness to be the, the most fecund, the most luscious, the most um, ripening territory of our life is to go into the dark. Because that's where we meet our most human qualities, our most human experiences, like grief, which is going to be laid at everyone's doorstep. So if you avoid the darkness, every time grief comes or fear or loneliness, you're terrified. But if you begin to become familiar with the dark, that's a territory. It requires a different kind of seeing, to see in the dark. There's a wonderful little passage by you. Rainer Maria Rilke, the, the Austrian poet, he says, um, and yet, no matter how deeply I go down into myself, my God is dark. And like a webbing made of a hundred roots that drink in silence. So everything that we're seeing out here right now, I'm sitting in the forest in Northern California above the Russian River. Everything I'm seeing is because of what's happening in the dark and the roots and the microbes, and the mycelia. Everything they're doing down there is what gives life up here. And the same of think about our own lives. We talk about, again, having a deep conversation. We have to go down into the depths. And we have to overcome our fear of that depth by slowly becoming familiar with what is there. It's, again, you think about myth and fairy tale. Where's the treasure? It's in the depths, right? It's underground. It's in the underworld. It's not laying up on a on the surface someplace. We have to go down. Yeah. When you talk about the long dark as this period of reorientation, initiation into soul, uh, that can sound quite intimidating to people. How long is this dark? How deep is this dark? How dark is it? Uh, do you see this as a as an historic age that is playing itself out that we are a part of but won't see the end of? Is that that I is that correct? Yeah, I think many of us won't see the end of this um, the long dark. What I'm referring to is that this this period of time that we're in is not one of ascension, like I said before. It is a time of descent where things are falling apart and by necessity. I love the models that comes out of alchemy. We're in what in alchemy would be, they would call the negredo. And the negredo means the blackening. It's a time of things dissolving, of things falling apart, of decay, of death. And don't many of the things that we have institutionalized need to decay and fall apart? I mean, systemic racism, economic injustice, you know, uh, massive levels of consumption. These things are death dealing to humans, but also to the planet. And so we're, we're entering a phase, I think we're in it right now, where uh, the long dark is a process that we have to participate in. It is an initiatory, it's what I call a rough initiation. It's unguided, it's uh, uncontained, but we are clearly being asked to shift our sense of allegiance and our sense of identity to some larger culture, a planetary culture, that is more faithful to watersheds than it is, again, to my own, my own portfolio. How do we participate in that is really the, the core question of our time. I just wrote the preface for um, Dwayne Elgin's latest book called Choosing Earth. Uh, and it's really about the next five decades. And they are heavy. The amount of loss is going to be enormous. And if we're not prepared for that, if we're not ready to lean into that, we will not be able to support and participate in any possibility of us getting to the long, the farther shore of the long dark. You said there's three possibilities. There's business as usual, which will lead to inevitable collapse of all systems. There's an authoritarian possibility which we're catching glimpses of right now, right? I mean, the, the, 
the fascist language that's coming out right now is scary. And the third one is what he calls the great transition. The possibility that by 2050 or 2060, there may have been enough suffering that humanity might say, the only way out is, is, is through, and the only way through is together. Okay. So I had to read all that and then write something meaningful. You know, how do you write? What do you <laughs> So I talked about the long dark. I talked about our apprenticeship with sorrow. Because as we're beginning to recognize is that grief isn't just about losing someone or something you love. Grief is around us constantly these days. Both the, old, the shedding of my own integrity through you know, shame and losses, but also the world's losses are continuously around us. And we are being asked to, to recognize the extent and depth and degree of the losses that are there and to work with them, not just to endure them. And the idea is that grief changes us, but it changes us by our participation in it. You know, so we're not just asked to get through to the other side. That's passivity. That's praying to not have to do it. Whereas this work is actually trying to deepen us into that deeper fidelity to, to the world. And yet it seems to me the participation in that grief and the leaning into the, the long dark doesn't mean losing our joy it doesn't mean losing our uh, our wonder our, our gladness for being here uh, how do you what do you say to someone who says the world is in such a mess there's so much suffering i don't deserve to be happy well again that's kind of a passive place to stand um, when you engage grief and you engage engage suffering it breaks the heart open to joy, to delight. At every grief ritual I've led, which is close to 100 grief rituals over the past 25 years, as people's hearts begin to let go of the cumulative sorrow that they've been carrying, a, a, an opening takes place and a delight begins to come into the room. And by the end of the ritual, we are giddy. We are delighted to be in each other's company and we celebrate the beauty. If we avoid grief, if we, if we refuse to go into that lower register of sorrow and loss, we collapse the upper dimensions of joy and delight and wonder. And we live in what I call a flatline culture where we live very small, emotional, controlled lives. But we need to feel the depths and we need to feel the heights. I spent some time in a village in Africa some years ago, and I walked up to one woman who I got to know a little bit. I said, you have so much joy. And her immediate response was, well, that's because I cry a lot. A stunning, very un-American answer. They're completely un-American. It wasn't because I keep myself busy or I got a new car or, you know, I just went shopping. Her heart because in that culture where she was living, you could not deny death's presence. It was everywhere. So you're constantly working the deep ground of grief and your heart is then simultaneously touched by the gentle moments of kindness, the, the call of a bird, the, the particular you know, blossom of a, of a plum. You know, everything delights you then. You know, so contrary to our fears, if I go into the grief, it'll just be, you know, heavy, dark, you know, somber days. My experience has been just the opposite. If you don't go there, your days will be kind of saturated with that grayness when we want color. And grief is incredibly vital. I remember once my friend, we were driving back from a conference and my friend asked me, are you happy? I said, well, I have moments of being happy. And I delight in those. I'm grateful for those. But what I said, what I want is to be alive. And all of these emotions, grief, sadness, hurt, anger, there's vitality in all of them. And what I want is to feel the vitality. 
we are kind of become this, particularly in psychological worlds right now, we're obsessed with happiness. Mm-hmm. You know, the happiness index. Nothing wrong with that. But then we create, again, that bifurcation of what are the good emotions and what are the negative emotions. I don't know who made that scale up, but it's wrong. I work a lot with cancer patients and, you know, they're always told to think positively and stay hopeful and this one-sided dimension, but these are, the other guests are all there, right? The fear, the, the grief, the death, the the despair, they're all there. Mm-hmm. And like any good fairy tale, they will crash the party. Mm-hmm. So I think our work right now is immensity, is to get our arms around all of it to become familiar with the ground of grief and loss and fear, befriend them, know them, walk with them. They will make our experiences of joy and love and kindness all the more um, saturated with re- with realness. You know, I think it was Theodore Rethke said, we want to experience the holiness of the real, you know, that's what I want, not the saccharine qualities of, you know, hopefulness, but the true experience of hope that's rooted in knowing the way the world is. Mm-hmm. Well, not denying that mm-hmm. truth, but this is what the world looks like right now. I'm curious, shifting gears just a bit, uh, you talk about responsibility versus rights being another sort of central tenet of soulfulness and reimbuing culture with soulfulness. And yet there's so much emphasis now on identity politics uh, and the rights of different groups versus other groups. How can we be both politically woke, <laughs> awake, uh, and moving in the direction of responsibility being the priority? over personal rights? Yeah, I mean, that's a complicated question. Um, When you think about soul, another quality of soul is that it tends to dwell on the margins. It's not at the core of things. Soul is at the edges of what we notice and what we pay attention to. It's oftentimes in what we neglect, what we avoid. Culturally, that's true as well. These are marginalized cultures we're talking about. White dominant culture, part of our growing up is to become, is to take on the responsibility of recognizing what it is that we have neglected to honor in the LBGTQ community and the, you know, BIPOC community and indigenous communities and all of the ones that we have pushed to the margins. That's where soul is. They are the ones who have sustained soul all this time. And ironically, they are the ones that are teaching us again what soulful culture looks like. Not dominant, individualistic, white culture, but cultures of color, cultures of depth, cultures of richness and and beauty, cultures of imagination and poetry. You know, that's where it's coming back in from. Think of Standing Rock several years ago. They were the ones standing between, you know, the destruction of a water a shed there, you know, uh, and then industrialism again. They are the ones frequent, I'm, I'm sorry to speak in such generalities, but uh, our responsibility as white individuals is to recognize and honor the rights of those who have been denied them for all this time and to not keep clutching out of fear that we're going to lose our rights. We should lose some of those rights. We don't have the right to have other people suffer for our entitlements. That's why, again, recognizing our entanglements more than entitlements, our responsibilities more than rights, is part of our maturation. It's part of the deep initiation that we're all having to go through right now. So Donald Trump could be seen as a part of our return to the soul because it he what he represents brought up so much shadow but he brought up the he's responsible for the me too movement uh black lives matter happened during his during his reign and those are soul movements isn't that right those are soul movements yes and what we're also and what we recognize whenever there's an initiatory threshold approached there are those who are willing to undergo the work of initiation, and there are those who are unwilling and retrench the old attitudes. 
So we could say that Trump, in a sense, embodies the adolescent white male. It's all about me. What can I get? What's in it for me? And we see that re re-entrenchment with a certain sector of American culture right now, pushing back against women's rights, against you know, the rights of minorities. Uh, they want to hold on to that power. Well, that's an adolescent attitude. An adult initiated person wants to share power because the more that we are empowered communally, the better off we are. But that's that fear-based ideology that comes out of an adolescent mind. I'm going to lose out if everybody else gets it. So, yes, he um, activated a lot of the unconsciousness of this culture and exposed it and gave language to it and gave, you know, uh, memes to it. So we could actually look at it and go, oh, my God, that's, that's us. That's a lot of what this culture looks like. And it's ugly. And it's, you know, shameful. So hopefully even this past election gave a little bit of a rebuke to that. Um, as a, um, a dominant ideology, maybe there's more soul to the culture than we imagined. That's my, that's my. What I'm taking from this this last week of um, that there is some there are enough people saying just you know, another quality of, of soul is beauty. Soul is drawn to beauty and reacts to ugliness with with contraction. And so I think there was a contraction to this ugliness. And hopefully, investing a little bit more in the in the possibility of culture that establishes care and mutual kindness as a, as a basic premise rather than self-interest. This is a hard question to answer. I just want to bring up the topic of pessimism because pessimism is, is something that many people struggle with so much. They, they have the relative good news of last week's election, and, and, but, but they're convinced that nothing is really going to change. Is pessimism a function of soul? The soul would, again, have no problem with that. The problem with pessimism is passivity, typically. Mm. Uh, it, it's a kind of a non-righteous surrender, a giving up. Mm. Uh, and we can't afford that right now. I mean, I, I've certainly felt cynicism and pessimism and despair. And that's all there. But if we can take it alchemically and put that in the vessel and I keep warming that material through my attention, my affection, my writing, my reflection, what's, what does this want from me? What's, what's at the heart of pessimism? And maybe it's a fear of grief, you know, that I'd actually have to feel the losses around me. So I just kind of, yeah give up, you know, and I have no judgment about that. My God, none whatsoever, because it's, it's very easy to fall into that space right now. Of, particularly when you hear report after report after report from, um, you know, from United Nations and others that we are really at a desperately thin threshold between everything going to hell and that one election is not going to save us. So I guess from an initiated point of view is that, okay, then what, what is my response going to be? I was giving a talk up in Victoria, Canada some years ago and talking about grief and the apprenticeship of sorrow. And a young woman stood up and said, so what's the answer? I said, there isn't one. But there is a response, and every one of us must decipher what response we are being asked to make to the circumstances that we are facing. And cumulatively, our response might have enough substance to it to get us off the consumption track. I mean, that's the thing. Another thing about soul is that it's it's. What soul desires is what I call primary satisfactions. Sharing stories together, doing ritual work together when there's been a loss, 
or, or saying thank you together communally or sitting under the stars quietly, sharing meals together, sharing dreams, you know, what shaped us over several hundred thousand years, what allowed us to succeed were the primary satisfactions. And when those satisfactions are met, you don't crave the next electronic gadget. You don't desire the newest model of car. You just, you're satisfied primarily. We live in a culture right now that's designed to keep us dissatisfied. So we always, even psychologically, I think we're taught that we focus almost always on what did you lack? What was missing in your childhood? What was, and that's legitimate. We have to look at that. But we don't have an appreciative psychology, you know, that recognizes, my God, what a privilege to be in this body, you know, to have hearing. Some people don't. I mean, to, to really appreciate all the small things that we have been gifted with. You know, and to appreciate the work that we're doing. So I forgot the question. It was about pessimism. Is that what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you talk about uh, holding grief and gratitude in yeah. our hand. And that one without the other isn't, isn't balanced, isn't enough. Could you say something uh, about why gratitude without grief isn't, uh, isn't sufficient? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, what I think about is the, the mark of a mature human being is that they carry grief and gratitude simultaneously. And they are allowed, they allow that those energies to stretch us large. So we become immense beings. Grief without gratitude can lead to cynicism, to lead can lead to that deep pessimism that you were just speaking about, Mark, and the sense of hopelessness. But gratitude without grief tends to lead towards a more kind of a saccharine kind of thing. Uh, appreciate things, but it's hard to then carry compassion for another person's suffering. Grief deepens the heart's capacity to know what another person may be feeling. So together they form the prayer of life. You know, simultaneously these energies are there. I can be driving to work and it's a glorious, hazy, foggy day. The sun's coming through it. And then I see the fox dead by the side of the road. You know, instantaneously, I'm in both worlds. I'm holding on to both. I remember working with a woman once uh, years ago uh, during the Iraq war. It was the first Iraq war. And um, she had literally got on the floor of my office sobbing and just, just sobbing for the children, for the depleted uranium, for the destruction of these holy sites. And, and I let her cry for like 15 minutes. I just sat, just holding the space for her. And then I, I leaned toward her and I said, did you happen to notice the plum blossoms were out today? And she said, no. I said, did you happen to notice the mustard was in bloom? And she said, no. So, well, we can't possibly tolerate the horrors of war without plum blossoms and mustard blooms. You know, the heart needs that grief and gratitude in a constant conversation with one another. There are moments in grief that are so exquisitely beautiful, Mark. When they're in the middle of our grief rituals, when there's a group of people down there at the grief shrine sobbing together, howling out of their losses and their outrage that's what is happening it is so exquisitely beautiful you wouldn't think it but there's something so pure about that moment that you're not wondering what's going on with them you know what's going on with them and then they come back their eyes they've just washed their face with holy water and they're coming back to the village and they're greeted every time you can go down to the shrine many times in our, in our ritual and every time you come back, you're greeted by the village saying, thank you. Thank you for doing what you just did. You helped empty the communal cup of sorrow. You helped me feel lighter just by what you did down there. That's exquisitely beautiful. How can you not feel grateful? At the same time, you're in the midst of this deep, deep sorrow, you know. But again, that's where we get these bifurcations rather than these conversations. It isn't either or. It is the both, both and, yeah. Matthew Fox talks about 
uh, the fact that we live in a beautiful universe, not a pretty one. And that's what I hear when you talk about it because there's, I mean, there are many different colorations to, be to beauty. And many of, them are, many of them are dark and many of them yes. are yes. intense and some of them are conflictive and that yes. also can be a part of beauty. Absolutely. If you think of a painting, yeah. if there were no dark contrast colors in there, yeah. it would just be flat. The darkness adds depth and it, it is what it makes it, those moments so exquisitely beautiful. One last question I'd like to ask you. You mentioned ritual, and of course, we could talk for about a month about ritual. I love what you say uh, about ritual is able to hold the long discarded shards of our stories and make them whole again. It has the strength and elasticity to contain what we cannot contain on our own, what we cannot face in solitude. Right. So beautiful. What kinds of rituals can we bring into our lives to help us lean into the long dark and support each other in this time of initiation into a, a very different kind of world? Yeah, that's a very important question, Mark, because uh, in our individualistic society, again, particularly our, our white culture, it's up to me to somehow process all this grief. And we can't. So the heart shuts down wisely. And so we have a lot of people walking around with very closed off hearts. The beauty of what we're talking about is that ritual recalls the old truth about this is that grief has always been communal. Through our long story as a species, grief has never been private until now. You even go to private practice to talk about your grief. You know, um, I'm glad they come, but I almost tell everybody I work with, this is a good place to start. This is a good place to come into contact with your grief, but ultimately you will need a larger holding space for it. See, our psyches are the inheritors of a very rich lineage, a very rich story, because no matter where we come from, every one of us will go back to a place in which we did communal ritual to process the inevitable experiences of life, death, loss, pain, suffering, gratitude, beauty, that was all held communally. And, commun and ritual is that frequency, it's that pitch that enables what is most vulnerable in the human being to come forward. It recognizes it. There's a quality that gets, that gets um, activated in ritual space that the psyche recognizes, that's what I've been waiting for. You know, so many times at the end of a ritual, in the, when we do the grief work, Somebody will say something like, you know, I've never done anything like that in my life. But it was oddly familiar. Jung called it the unforgotten wisdom at the core of the psyche. So when you ask, what can we do? Well, we can gather in small circles of four, five people. Put a candle in the middle of the circle. Say a poem or a prayer and say, tonight, we're going to talk about loss. But let's just listen to one another. Let's not fix a damn thing. Grief isn't a problem to be fixed. It's a presence awaiting witnessing. So if we can witness one another's grief and we can share it, like our openings in our, in our grief circles, we'll go around and ask people to share one thread of grief because they all come in with many. But just name one thread of grief you're bringing into the circle. And we go around and we hear about, you know, suicides of children or partners and cancers and diagnosis and deaths. We have marriages failing. We hear about all the most difficult things. By the time we go around, I all ask, was there any grief shared here that you could not relate to? And of course, no. I may not have had that experience, but grief is grief. We all know that. So we talk about well, this is our shared grief. This is our communal grief. It isn't mine and that's yours. This is ours. So that's what ritual helps us remember is the communal process of human living. It's the shared experiences that actually make us feel most intimate and most connected and most likely that we belong to one another. So simple rituals like that of gathering in circle. Sometimes I, in the back of my book, uh, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, I. Uh, I give people some examples of simple rituals they can do, like 
putting a bowl of water in the middle of that circle with lots of small stones around them. And when a person's ready, they go and they pick up a stone and they speak a particular grief into that stone aloud. So everyone can witness that. And then they put it in the bowl. And after a while, you begin to see that bowl fill up again. This is our grief. Mm -hmm. Then you can take that water out and give it to the green world. You know, bless some thirsty plant. And our grief grows roots. It's fertile water for that plant to metabolize our sorrows into something beautiful again. So there's many simple rituals we can do. Um, and to trust ourselves. Make some up. And what is it, you know, we are so ritually illiterate mm -hmm. in this society. So we have to begin to experiment. I mean, most of the rituals that I've that I've led here have been, I say the earth is a great dreaming creature. And if we pay attention and listen, the images will come to us of what we need to do at this particular time, in this particular way, with these particular gestures that will help us to begin to repair what has been torn. And that's what ritual does. It's a constant suturing process. Because to be human is to constantly be in and out, torn and healed, whole and broken. But that's what ritual does. It's an ongoing process of bringing the community back together again, stitching the soul back together again. I can't imagine life without ritual in my life. It's repair. You know, the Jew, they talk about repair in the Kabbalah. Yes. Yes, cool. World yeah. repair, Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Francis Weller. This has been an amazing conversation, and people are going to learn so much and benefit uh, from all that you have to share. So, the work you do, I just deep bows to you, and I hope that we see each other again sometime. Mark, I had a wonderful time talking to you today. Excellent questions, and I all praise to you and your efforts as well. Thank you, sir. See you soon. Bye-bye.